Business is messy and unpredictable. Sometimes lonely. So lonely. So lonely. (laughs) And inspiration can often come from really weird places. We pick up where the bullet point blogs and the highlight reels leave off. We start with the stories. Welcome back to So Here's My Story. I'm Jody. I'm Elliot. And for this one, we kind of dug deep into the Wayback Machine to pull out an episode that's one of our favorites, and we hope you enjoy it too. Oldie but goodie. So here's my story. And I'll, I'll tell the story carefully. I, I, I can tell it generally because it, it is a, it's a very personal story for someone and it's not my story. So that's, that's a line I always hold in the world of um, confidentiality when something's not my story. I don't tell it. So um, I am going to tell pieces of this, but um, might keep it a little bit vague. So a very good friend of mine and I were talking um, in the past week or two um, she and her husband are having some marriage issues and as, as, as all married people do at one time or another. And we got to this point in the conversation and, you know, it, it occurs to me now after I went through that whole preamble, details are irrelevant here because I think everyone can find some sort of space in this where they've had these kinds of thoughts where um, at one point we were talking about contemplation about the difference between, you know, about whether or not she stays or goes, which I think is sort of the obvious question that, right. that she, that people can, empathize with. But then we got to this really interesting point in the conversation where I was asking her because I sensed this like weird energy when she talked about staying and she wasn't super excited about going, but there was something really convoluted about the way she talked about staying. And so I asked her a question that ended up becoming this wildly fascinating conversation that I've now been thinking about in so many other contexts, including business, which is what is the difference between staying and not leaving. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I just want to pause for a second there to sort of let that sink in. So there's going. That's so staying and going. Those right, are clearly opposite. Because going seems like an affirmative choice. So You're going. Going is a choice. Staying felt weird and sna- there was like a snag in the way she talked about staying. And I was like, what's the difference between staying and not leaving? And her whole body posture just sort of like slumped. <laughs> And she goes, yeah, it's actually hard for me to imagine staying. It only feels like not leaving. Mm, but there's such a different energy about those two. Yes, yes, yes. So, and we we could we could go into that aspect of it from relationships, but I, I want to, you know, this is, I, I want to relate it quickly over to something that I see happen so often in the in the teams and the the partnerships that I work with, where. Because I don't actually, in, in that context, there is something that looks like not leaving. But but the way that I sort of see this happen and, and the conversation I wanted to open up here is I think sometimes that middle lane sort of is is imagined like it's a place that you can hang out. The not leaving lane. The not leaving lane. Um, and and, and it's, you know, we, we could argue that in marriages, maybe, maybe that does exist. Um, but I think, I, I don't know that, I believe it exists or I, or it shouldn't exist. It shouldn't exist anywhere, really, I don't think. Um, but in companies, what I see happen sometimes is there'll be an employee that someone's frustrated with. and Or, or it can even happen as, as you are the employee. Um, but in this case, like there's an employee you're frustrated with and you're not ready to terminate them. Right. Like they're super clear on that. Like, no, 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 no. We don't want to, we don't want to get rid of them. Like they, they provide value or, or we think they have potential or whatever it is, or it's just would be a hassle to lose that person right now. So they're not ready to terminate them. But they're also not really in the energetic space of committing to that person. They imagine that there's sort of this middle ground of, eh. And, and I really strongly believe that that is a dangerous perception that there is this sort of middle lane where you can hang out between the two. But, but I'm, so I'm curious if that is just my perspective or I want to hear what you think about that. Well, I guess one of my questions is, do you think that middle lane of not staying is equivalent to saying, I don't want to terminate them, but if given the chance, I wouldn't rehire them again? I think it could be a lot of things. I, I absolutely that. Like, you know, I'll, I'll just let them kind of hold. So let's break it down because I think there's a couple different circumstances. The, the place where I see it be the most dangerous is if I have actually, if I'm there to help some, if I'm working with somebody who is is problematic for some reason, which I don't do a ton of, but, um, and, and the person that, 
has asked me to work with them is imagine is trying to sort of stay in this middle lane. This is where it's really dangerous because if you're not ready to fire them, I need you in the I'm committed to this because if your that middle lane sticks an oar in the water and we're already to, we're trying to, to turn the tide on something really complicated. Usually we're asking somebody to to counteract lifelong coping mechanisms <laughs> that they've that they've had and that's a big ask. Um so that's already hard without somebody kind of um, talking the talk of being supportive, but they really don't believe it's possible. Well, I, you know, I, I get this question a lot and I get it a little bit farther along in the thought process. So I'll have a client that calls me and says, I need to talk to you about uh, an HR issue, specifically about an employee. So right away, the background is they've taken the step of calling their attorney. Mm. This isn't musing to their spouse or just thinking right. on the way home. They've called their attorney. Yeah. And so the <laughs> conversation often goes, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. I'm talking about, um, you know, Lisa and all of these Not Lisa happened. Benson. Not Lisa Benson. <laughs> um, <laughs> to be clear. Because if we were talking about Lisa, we'd probably need um, – Mary Craft staffing right. and HR solutions <laughs> to fill that void. But anyway, right. so I'm talking about, about other Lisa, other Lisa. And all of these things um, have combined to make this person a problem for me. And I'll say, well, do you want to fire them? You know, because I'm first I'm going to do they have an employment contract or they at will, etc. No, I don't really want to fire them. I'm just wondering how to get my ducks in a row to do that. And then maybe Maybe I should just have a talk that says, here are my concerns, and I need you to address these within the next X number of days. And so this is the next question, which is, what if they do address it yeah. in the next number of days? What if you've said, here are three things that I need you to address, and they do that in 30 days? Are you going to be happy Right. Keeping them because you can't, the rules of the game are you can't say address these three things. They address these three things and you look at them and go, yeah, I'm still going to fire you. Yeah. Well, well, this does actually tie directly back to my original origin story of this, of this podcast, which is that was exactly the conversation we were having. You know, it was, it was coming around this. So I think this is one version of why it's problematic. If, you know, if my friend is saying, well, husband, you know, I'm disgruntled about X, Y, and Z and husband magically changes X, Y, and Z and is doing and magically does everything that she asks, is, is she going to be happy? Or, or is that just sort of a, is she saying it because she's hoping he won't do X, Y, and Z and then she'll have, yeah, which, which is a really confronting question. It, it, I think it's where, so this thing you're talking about, I think is where stuck and or that feeling of being stuck or not having choices. Sometimes it, it feels like that, but it's actually this. I, one of the very first coaches I ever met one time said to me when I said, I feel so stuck. And she goes, well, you know what I think stunk, stuck is? Stunk. <laughs> what I think stuck is? And I said, what? She said, I think a lot of times stuck is when you know, you already know what you want to do. You're just not ready to do that thing. Or you're not ready to admit that you are, that you, that's what you want to do. And, and I, and in this case, I think there is sometimes when people are trying to get into that middle lane, they want to look like they're working on it, but they, really know what they want. No, they've made, and that's what I wrote down. You've made the decision emotionally. You've made that emotional mm. decision. You know what your gut reaction is. You're trying to line now up you're, the, the facts you're around You're looking for it. validation. <laughs> right. That's right. You know what car you want to buy. Right. Now you're, now you're asking about the mileage because you're hoping it gets good mileage so you can back up your initial decision to buy it. You, if you've already made the decision, in my world, if you've already made the decision that you're going to fire this person, then unless you really believe, unless we kind of brainstorm and say, you know what, if you fire this person, you're going to be sued faster than you can turn around. Mm -hmm. And so you better take certain steps in, in corporate self-defense. Unless it's that. If, if right. you don't have that, um, we try to get to the bottom of, well, have you already made the decision to fire this person? Because don't make them work on don't it. Don't make them work on it. And don't set up a process where their best outcome leaves you disappointed. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, there's that quote, and this doesn't exactly apply, but I always, it always makes me think of it when I see it, that um, that's like this, the C, I don't know, it's a whole meme thing. It says like, w you know, what if we invest in people and they leave? And it says, well, what if you don't, don't invest in them yeah. and they stay? It's a, it's a tiny bit like that. Like you don't, your heart's not in trying to get them to change. Um, 
or, or, or get them to do what you need. So, so there's, there's so many aspects to this um, that I hope it's not getting confusing because it's, it feels applicable in a lot of ways, but sort of in this same mix, Blessing White is this really fantastic company that has all this research and modeling, um, like models around engagement that are some of my favorite because they, they address both what the organization's role is in engagement as well as the individual's role in engagement, which is not always addressed. So I think that's super important. But they have this this sort of X model of engagement that shows like personal satisfaction and company and organizational contribution as an X. And then in that square in the middle, they have this grid of engagement sort of profiles. And somebody might be high on personal satisfaction, but low on company contribution. But that might be because they're brand new. You know, it's not always bad. It's like people move from one place to the other. Mm -hmm. And then I can't, I'll, I'll not quote it correctly if I try and say it right now. So maybe we can, I can get it for Christy in the show notes, but there's this place, there are a couple places that they point out where people are super at risk. And one of them is like, if they're at this point, you know, you might lose them or worse. And I think it's like low personal satisfaction, high company contribution, Mm -hmm. you know, that can be like, um, it says, um, or maybe it's when they drop down to low on both. It says you risk losing them or worse. And I love this phrase. They quit and stay. Yeah. And that is that that's the sort of employee we've been talking about it from a from a like if you have someone working for you An and you're, you're point of view. quitting, you know, yeah. the employer point of view, but from the employee standpoint, this middle lane it, to me it feels like, you know, taking your foot off the gas, it feels like a kind of compromise that's not the good kind of compromise. It's like resignation maybe and not in the I quit my job resignation, but kind of like w- loss of hope. I guess probably is what feels so important about not imagining that that middle lane is a place where much of anything good happens because it's like this, it's this DMZ between ending it or committing to it where, where none of the things that you need to make something better exist. There's no hope. There's no passion. There's no, there's no drive. There's no commitment. There's no, there's nothing. There's well, nothing a lot to eat of, there. There's no hope or drive or commitment. There is yearning, I think, a lot of times. So there are two things mm. that occurred to me. One is that I was always taught that there's always a scale. Every employee has a scale. And um, they're going to even out the scale between on one side, what they devote to a company, on the other side, what they perceive they're getting out. So whether that's money, they think they're underpaid, then they're going to dial back their contributions, or they think they're undervalued in other things besides money, or they think that that they don't have a future because they're not allowed to get better, and they're going to dial back. So there's that um, small r resignation mm-hmm. uh, part of it. But there is a yearning, and it kind of reminds me... Um, when my my dad, as you know, uh, was an attorney. We lived in uh, Baltimore County. He worked around Annapolis, which for people who are not of here is, you know, it's not a horrible commute, but it used to take him about 45 minutes back in the yeah. day. And, and he was in a one horse town where his practice was. And the bottom line was he wasn't where his client base and his practice and his business and his business life were not where he wanted them to be. He mm-hmm. wanted them to be closer to Baltimore County where he liked the community and where he wanted to be. And what my dad used to tell me, even as I was growing up as a teenager, was I wish. I wish this. I wish mm. that. I wish this would. And even as a teenager, I would say, well, what are you doing? You know, yeah. what, why don't you just take these steps? And it would come up with all the reasons, many yeah. of which were valid. I wasn't a... This reminds me of the attorney. episode we did about this a while ago with your dad. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he would tell me the reasons why he couldn't... Right. He couldn't go. There's an absence of agency. Yeah. yeah. And so there's this wistfulness. So in your mm-hmm. job, in that middle lane, I think there's a lot of, on both sides... I wish she was better. I wish she would leave. I wish he would do this. I wish he would do that. I sometimes it's I wish I wish they would just fire me. Yes. Yes. No, that is that is it's this it's this lost zone between two things that I think people start to imagine that here's <laughs> I think here's why it sort of seems like a safe place to hang out. I think people easily get there when so take take it from the employer perspective. I have somebody that's not working out. Committing to them feels hard and maybe futile. 
and maybe whatever. There's a lot of words you can put there where it feels like ugh, not super exciting to go over there. And firing them sometimes feels exciting, but that feels hard and yucky. And it comes with other things. It comes with a lot of baggage. It comes with a lot of baggage. Both things, when both ends of that spectrum, spectrum come with baggage, I think there's this imagined safe zone in the middle where I'm just going to hang out between the two and I'm not really going to work on it, but I'm also not going to let them go. And it feels, there's this very false sense of security. Like it feels like a safe place, but it is a, in in my perspective, a ranging danger zone. And, 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 oh God. <laughs> no. And, and because there were there, I do have, this is like a four story episode. So, um, <laughs> Also, I, I, so here's my other story. Other story. I had mentioned this before too, but I was um, engaged before um, mm-hmm. I met and married. Uh, Just like you wife. had another podcast before you yes. met me. Yeah, with exactly. Me. It's it's that it's a serial. <laughs> you know, I it's like the dry run before the, right. the serious thing. So anyway, there was a time to, to cut to the chase. There was a time when I realized she was a perfectly wonderful human being, but I didn't want to marry her. Mm-hmm. And I remember more than one occasion i was just wishing that i would walk in unexpectedly into the townhouse that uh, where she lived and find her in bed with another guy and then i could go <laughs> well there it is i guess this is over now because that would that's a no brainer i'm ab- not the bad guy yeah. hint I, if you find yourself imagining <laughs> that it's probably it's, not right. the best so place. and of course she that was never going to happen she's a perfectly lovely person and it just wouldn't but i that every day and I would wake up just with my stomach in knots because I knew that hanging out in that middle wishing that somebody would end it for me yeah. was not a place to be. No, and it's and it's it's um I have I have tried to start using that sense of um wishing somebody else would fix it for me. Like that that because it has a very specific feeling to it for yeah. me where I'm I feel Sometimes it also makes me feel like I don't I don't have choices or power. Like, I think that's a story that gets wrapped around it. Like, oh, I don't have a choice or I can't do this. I wish someone else would do it for me. I'm like, wait a minute. Why did I get in the backseat of the car? Like I'm I'm sitting in the backseat of the car about something that matters to me. Well, I need to get back into the driver's seat and, and make a decision. No, I think you do have a choice. I think it's just that you're not willing to because if you turn right or you turn left, there's stuff attached. So, geez, it would be so much better if somebody pushed you into that. Yes. No, but that that's the point. I think it can feel like you don't have a choice, but that's sort of the, the, the coping mechanism to not acknowledge that you have a choice. You're just not making it like, so, so interesting thing. I think this, the, it's like, what do you do with all this? Um, there's a reason that we have real and honest in the tagline of the podcast, because I think it is the, the salve for so many things and especially the things where it feels like you're like, Oh God, not that, not that. Like don't, it's like my friend who does nutrition. She's like people who love cheese are the ones who usually are the ones who are actually, you know, dairy intolerant. They're like, don't take cheese. <laughs> like, I feel like honesty is that way sometimes. But if you take that, um, that like employer situation again, I've seen so many circumstances where when the honest conversation comes out, instead of the, just kind of like avoiding the person or, or pretending to try, like putting them on a performance plan, but, but like, but not really, really investing in them, just sort of like going through the motions. So you don't look like a bad guy. Or setting up a performance plan, you know, they can't possibly meet. Or they can, and maybe they do. And then you're still like, damn it. Like, right. You're <laughs> really, disappointed. Right. Right. So the honesty of going to somebody and saying, you know what, this isn't working. Like this won't always be the case, but I can't tell you how often I've seen it be the case that the person's like, I know it's not like, it's like, they aren't feeling like with your fiance, she wasn't necessarily like, Oh, I agree this, this, you know, she may have had the complete opposite decision, but sometimes when you start those conversations and the other person is feeling it too. So bringing that conversation there's about a 50 50 chance it, it won't be as yucky as you think it is because sometimes you're speaking to something that the other person is also sitting in the middle ground on. So that's sort of like the first layer of it. But even when not, the reality of it not being a good fit or that there being a problem that doesn't work and being able to address it. So, two sort of very quick versions of this, and I'll wrap it back to the other story to kind of wrap this up. I, I've past couple of weeks, I've been involved with a client conversation who was working with someone that was, was, was a bad hire on my client's part. And they knew that going in, it was kind of a panic hire and they kind of knew it wasn't the right thing. We've all done it. Um, and it, 
just the, the person's doing all the right things, but it's just not the right fit. And, and everybody knows it, or, you know, he, he certainly knew it. Well, and he felt bad about that. So he wanted to keep giving her a chance. Like, like he's like, well, let's, let's just, let's like support him. Like, dude, this isn't working. He's like, I know, I know, but it's our fault. We hired the wrong person. I'm like, right. But you hire the wrong person. She's frustrated. You're frustrated. It's never going to get better. And so finally we were able to sit down and I actually sat in on it to make this conversation go better. Um, Cause he was so nervous about it. And we just had that conversation all of us with her and say, Hey, this isn't working. And she's like, is this my two weeks notice? She kind of panicked. And we said, no, 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 no. Look, let's all just be really honest about how this isn't working. And let's take the next couple of weeks to help you find something else. Like you keep doing your stuff for us. We're going to restrict it to just these things because that part's working really well. You spend some of your time, you know, and we'll try to connect you with people. And over the course of a couple of weeks, they were able to find her something else. And it's, and Every, and now she's someplace where she can go be exactly what she is. And it's a really good fit. Right. But I think that in order to, I love that solution. If I think that, that in order to hold that conversation, you have to be clear in your mind as to the alternatives you're willing to accept or not. So mm -hmm. go back to your initial story. You know, you have, um, a married couple and if one of them has decided after whatever angst goes into that, that there she doesn't or he doesn't want to stay married mm -hmm. then going into the conversation say this isn't working you know let's talk about how we can make it better if the other spouse is saying let's go to counseling and let's do this and let's do that but you know that the only solution you're willing to accept is an amicable split mm -hmm. um then then th there's a danger i guess in pretending that you're willing to collaborate on on other solutions. I I think it's more than a danger. I actually think it's cruel. Yeah. I think it's cruel to drag somebody through a process where you're pretending like there's an outcome available to them that is not available to them. Right. So that's that's what I'm saying and and we're in agreement. You just have to be crystal clear because you can't go into the conversation hoping and this is where your strategy is. To also ends. say, yeah, you just me too. hope for that amicable split and that's it. No, but, but what, and this was a different couple because my friend I was talking to this weekend isn't there, but I have other friends who, who were in this exact same place. Um, and they, they, you know, it, it wasn't, it wasn't the most lovely conversation ever. And it wasn't one conversation, but at the, at, after several conversations, they actually decided that they were going, they actually created some very different. So, so what they did, these were, these were, this is from this story is from 15 or 20 years ago. Um, family friends of ours, they came up with a solution. They stuck to the conversation of what do we really, what do we each really care about and what's important to us and what do we not want this to look like? And if, you know, even though this was really a one sided thing because not, they didn't both want it, but they were able to stay in the conversation of what do we care about? And they came up with some really off the wall things. Like they actually kept their house and the kids always stayed at the house. And the parents moved hmm. in and out because both of them didn't want to have a divorce where the kids were. That was one thing. They didn't want this to impact the kids any more than it had to. So they figured out a solution to that. They are as amicable of a split as, as I could see their being. And that, 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 you know, again, you get into relationships that rely, that, that leans back on a million variables about, you know, people's personalities and values and whatnot. So I'm not saying that's the way to go, but the point being the ability to stay in the honest conversation and just talk about the things that are is the way through that. What you can't ever do is know where that path leads. But if you keep looking under the rocks of what people care about and what's honest, that's how you, I think that's how you find your way there and out of that middle ground because nothing good ever comes in that middle ground. So that's our story. But the discussion doesn't have to end here. No, it does not. In fact, we don't want it to. No, we don't. <laughs> that is why we actually have our private Facebook group. Which we started to make sure that we could get your comments, your rants, your thoughts. Your stories. Your stories. You can find links to that group as well as show notes and links to subscribe via email and how to find us just about anywhere you can possibly find podcasts at SoHere'sMyStory.com. And you can also find us on Facebook and Twitter 
at SHMS Podcast. And since we know it takes a village. Yes, it does. <laughs> we'd like to thank our village, our super talented, incredibly patient team. And occasionally snarky Ooh, team. Yeah, but in the best of ways. In the best Love of it ways. Snarky. Yes. <laughs> Good mockery. So, so a huge shout out to the people who actually help us produce our show. Uh, first, our sound engineer, Tom Hansen. Thanks to Christy Schmier for our brilliant show notes and all the other fantastic writing she does for us. And to Taylor Mathauer for doing just a little bit of everything. Thing. Including wrangling us. Including wrangling us. <laughs> Which is no small feat. No, it's not. This is Jody Hume. And I'm Elliot Wagenheim. And you've been listening to So Here's My Story.